Hey guys, Dennis on Magic here, and I just wanted to make a quick video showing off some of the really good cards that are going to be useful for Hour of Devastation at the pre-release. Now, some of these are really obvious, but um, depending upon your level of experience with pre-releases and sealed building as opposed to constructed building, uh, some of these might be surprises to you, and, and uh, quite a few of these might be surprises to just about anybody. Now, I'm going to leave out the really obvious ones, like, hey, a Planeswalker, one of the god cards, and honestly, they aren't that great because you got to make those two colors work now. Like, congratulations, you just pulled Samut or Nicol Bolas. Well, I sure hope those colors are good, otherwise you can't just lean on one card. But yeah, if you can make the Scarab God or the Locust God or the Scorpion God work, you just won. So, too obvious not even including them. And uh, really just stupidly obvious cards like Crested Sunmare that just if you play it you'll win. Yeah, I think those go without saying. So the first one that might be a little bit under your radar is the Amit Eternal. It is a 5-5 five, five for 3. Uh, does have a flick 3, so whenever uh, this creature becomes blocked, the defending player still takes 3 damage. Except they don't take 3 damage, they lose 3 life. There's a technical difference. I'm sure it won't come up. So it is a 5-5 five, five the second it comes out, but whenever an opponent casts a spell of any kind, whether you counter it or not, it gets a negative 1, negative 1 counter. So if it gets 5, it dies. That's not great. But whenever it deals combat damage to a player, remove all the negative 1, negative 1 counters from it. So uh, your opponent won't have a whole lot of control over how many spells they can cast per turn. So just with the game moving slower, um, this is just a good card. Now, once it gets down to like a 2-2, two, two, what are the odds you'll be able to swing and actually hit them? I mean, unless you can grant it menace, you can kill everything in its way. Not great, but uh, it can just keep resetting itself. You'll probably get one or two swings in at three to five damage, so that alone is worth it. Next up, Angel of Condemnation. I'm not going to read it word for word because it's incredibly annoying, but basically it's removal on a stick. You do have to exert it to remove something, and uh, if they manage to kill this or exile it or anything, they get all their cards back. But still, it's still repetitive removal on a stick. I mean, that's insane. And then, I mean, it's Flying Vigilance and 3-3. Three, three. So the funny thing is you could swing every turn with it, or you can swing, exert, remove something, or I should say remove a creature, and now there's no longer a creature in your way. And, of course, that happens before Declare Blockers. So, yeah, if they have one flyer, just get it out of the way. This is one of the absolute best cards you can pull at the pre-release, hands down. Or I should say from Hour of Devastation. So next up, Bane Wet Punisher, um, this one's just good. I mean, people think, oh, it's a 2-2 two, two for 3, I need to do damage, I need to win. Well, guess what? When it enters the battlefield, put a negative 1 counter on target creatures, so you already made something more uh, able to be dealt with. But if you really needed to, this is a kill spell for, we'll say, 4. So um, you can pay 1, and you don't have to tap it, so you can do this the turn it comes out. Sacrifice Bane Whip and destroy a target creature that has a ne negative 1 on it. So it's either a creature or a removal spell, or a creature and an equalizer that takes like a 3-3 makes it a 2-2. Do not underestimate the usefulness of negative 1 counters. Um, so next up we got Bantu's Last Reckoning. A lot of the last cards are uh, quite good. Um, this one, for 3, you just wipe the board. I mean, so what if lands don't untap? They're probably top decking. This is pre-release. This is not constructed. This is like legitimately at the pre-release. If you're losing the game... Just nuke everything and just cross your fingers, and that's actually a reasonable strategy. Not so much in Constructed, though. And next up, Champion of Wits. When it enters the battlefield, draw cards equal to its power, and then if you do, discard two cards. Its power is by default two, but if you uh, use Eternalize, it's a 4-4. Four, four. So you would then draw four, discard two. First of all, they have to kill this twice because you could bring it back. I mean, seven, okay. But um, also, pretty good attack. I mean, it's reasonable-ish. And then third... Get the crappy cards out of your hand and start drawing. I mean, you kind of want to mouth through your deck. A certain portion of the cards are going to be very not good. There are better draw cards, but this is good. So next up, Crash Through. This is really simple. It's a sorcery instead of an instant, but other than that, it costs one, and then at the end it says draw a card. So this card replaces itself. Congratulations, you're now playing with 39 cards instead of 40. It's really quite simple. And then creatures you control gain trample. I mean, okay. So it's not just, oh, it replaced itself, well, then replace it out of your deck. You actually need to make use of what the spell does, and yeah, I mean, all creatures you control gain trample, that's not bad. 
Dagger of the Worthy is next. This one's up there on the power level. So it only costs two in its equipment, and you can equip it for two, which is pretty good. And then equipped creature gets plus two attack, which is amazing, and has afflict once. So even if it gets blocked, they're taking one damage. This is just damage, damage, damage. I mean, it's really hard to blow up artifacts. Well, not really. It's just would somebody actually put in a destroy artifact card? Probably not. I mean, they're not playing against Kaladesh here, so yeah, at the pre-release, very hard to destroy artifacts, sort of. But I mean, they blow up the creature this is on, move it to the next one. Equipment is very, very good at the pre-release, so don't just say, ah, oh, it doesn't do anything cool, doesn't grant double strike, I don't like it. Hell no. Plus afflict. Next up, Devotee of Strength. Um, this is really nice because it's, once again, a repetitive spell. So if you're top decking garbage or you're just top decking in general you got a spell that you can cast on the field, except it's not, it's an ability, but same thing. So it's a three, two for three. That's already pretty good. I mean, it's not bad. Then you pay five and don't have to tap it or anything. Target creature gains plus two, plus two does not say target other creature. Now you're not going to have 10 mana, but if you could activate this, it's an ambush. It's like a constant ambush spell, except it's not an ambush because hopefully they saw it coming, but it, there's a chance they forgot that this was out there. It's not like they reread every single card, every single turn. So Either way, it's two extra damage a whole bunch of times, and it, it uh, saves you from top decking completely useless cards, sort of. Next up is Jeru with eyes open, or as I like to call it, um, Jeru former moron. For five, he's a 4-3 with Vigilance. I mean, that's just playing good. And then when it enters the battlefield, search your library for a Planeswalker card, reveal it, put it in your hand, then shuffle your library. Uh, then also he prevents one damage to any Planeswalker on the field that you own. So... Would I put him in uh, without a Planeswalker in my deck? Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be my first choice, but 4-3 Vigilance for 5, I mean, that's pretty good. But if you do have a Planeswalker, congratulations, now you have two Planeswalkers, because he'll go get it. I mean, this is right up there with, like, Conduit of Rune. I mean, this is just damn good. Next up, big surprise, a bunch of the uh, Aftermath cards are on here. Driven to Despair. Um, I'm just going to cover the top because the chances of you being on color with the bottom are, you know, abysmal. But nothing's stopping you from just using the top. So, uh, Driven to kind of sorcery until end of turn. Creatures you control gain trample. And whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. Oh my god, just swing with everything. Doesn't even matter if everything dies. You'll probably have three or four or five creatures dealing damage. Draw that many cards and replace the damn creatures. I mean, for two mana? Oh, hell Yes. I would dare say that that in itself is better overall than Thassa's Barbecue Fork, the legendary artifact. Okay, Bident of Thassa, but who the hell calls it that? Next up, Farm to Market, destroy attacking or blocking creature. It's a Celestial Flare, it's instant, I mean, it's removal, it's ambush, I love it. Also, honestly, Market's pretty good. Uh, then next up, Gift of Strength. Uh, it's an instant and target creature gains plus three, plus three. So, oh, oh and Reach, by the way. Hello. I love it when, like, the reach is so obvious in the card artwork. That is so funny. Anyway, don't think, ah, uh, three damage. I'd rather just put out a creature that could do three damage every swing. Uh, this instant is stupid. No, it's ambush. It's removal. Consider this a removal card, and everybody knows removal is king at the pre-release. It's usually your line of creatures versus their line of creatures, and the first person to lose enough creatures that the other person can overswing uh, loses. So if you swing with something that's a 2-2... A into a 3-3, three, three, they're going to be suspicious they might let it through. Well, good, you just did 3 or 2 damage. And then you could tack on the 3 and win if they have 5 life. So they probably actually would block under that scenario. Well, they just lost their creature. And then you could also use this defensively as an ambush. It's just the perfect card for 2. It's just so, so, so good. Next up, Grind to Dust. Put a negative 1 counter on each of up to 2 target creatures for 2. I mean, you could outright kill 1. You could maybe kill 2. That's a bit of a stretch, though. Um, otherwise, you just... You know, basically made some stuff uh, not able to swing for your opponent. Because, oh, now their 3-3s three swinging into your 2-2s two are now 2-2s. Two you know, like I said, don't underestimate negative one counters. I said I wouldn't. I'm going to anyway. Dust. <laughs> Exile any number of target creatures that have a negative one counter on them. What the hell? Not even all of them you get to pick. Oh, my God, does that work well with grind. But, like I said, grind by itself very playable i mean it, it's technically maybe a removal or at least like a stall card to make you know your opponent's combat phase kind of shut down 
Next up, Imminent Doom. Um, this might not work so great, but honestly, you're going to have a wide range of uh, converted mana costs, so we'll see. Uh, it enters the battlefield as an enchantment with the Doom counter on it. Whenever you cast a spell with converted mana cost equal to the number of Doom counters on Imminent Doom, Imminent Doom deals that much damage to target creature or player, then put another Doom counter on it. Very, very situational, and you bare minimum would have to have a couple spells that cost one. Otherwise, this is going to do literally nothing. So this one's shaky. It's just, if you think it'll work in your deck, it can deal so much damage to your opponent. So once you cast a one cost, and then they take one damage, it goes to two. I guarantee you've got some two cost in your deck. I guarantee you've got some three, and it's pretty damn likely you got four. So, like I said, you gotta have some ones, like at least probably... If this is even in your deck, I'd say three, because then, you know, then it's like, did you have it in an opening hand, and did you already throw it out on the battlefield? So, this one's shaky, it barely made the list, it's just, it can deal, like, six to, what, six to ten damage to your opponent? That's pretty good. Next up, Kefnet's Last Word. I love this, and I want it in foil already, and I haven't even seen it. It is double blue, take notice of that, but gain control of target artifact, creature, or enchantment. Lands you control don't untap, who cares because you just stole their best thing. You could literally give your opponent two turns in a row and they probably can't come back from this. Well, it depends what you stole, but if it's just your crappy line of creatures versus their subpar line of creatures and you stole one, well, now it's probably like five to two or something, so you can overswing. You don't have to give it back in case you didn't notice that. You get to keep it. Okay, at the end of the game, it would be nice to give it back, but uh, anyway, Lethal Sting is up next, um, starring the guy from uh, Avatar. That totally looks like him, doesn't it? Anyway, um, as an additional cost to cast Lethal Sting, put a negative one counter on a creature you control. That sucks, but then destroy target creature. It's a kill spell. You could probably survive it. I wouldn't necessarily trade, but this is just outright destroy target creature. As long as it doesn't have indestructible, it doesn't matter what size it is. There is so little removal that this gets elevated to, like, very playable status. Next up, Mana Lith. If you get it and you're playing two-color, which you probably are, put it in your deck. Now, it doesn't hit your opponent. It doesn't do anything. So, I mean, if your creature's short, take it right back out. But, um, add one mana of any color. I mean, it's just, it's universal fixing and who the hell is running artifact removal. It's just good. I mean, if you're really short on fixing and, and you've got a bunch of double colors, absolutely put this in. Like, if you've got double blue, double white all over your deck, you're going to need this, trust me. Plus, technically, you can use it the turn that it came out because it doesn't have summoning sickness. So, it's kind of like really good mana ramp, too. It's, it's just like a hard-to-destroy land, although land is hard to destroy, too. Next up, zero surprise here, Mirage Mirror. Uh, pay two becomes a copy of target artifact creature enchantment or land until end of turn, and then you can choose a different target the next turn. If they've got something gigantic, do it. Now, you don't get an ETB effect, unfortunately. It doesn't leave the battlefield then return as it, because that would be way too powerful. But, I mean, it is until end of turn, but you could do it on their turn, because it doesn't say sorcery speed. So if they're about to swing with a 5-5, clone it, and then you can chump block it. I mean, if they have a creature with, like, First Strike or Lifelink, they might not even be able to swing, and if they do, they're about to lose something because they, whoops, didn't read this card. I love everything about that card. It's so good. Next up, Neheb the Eternal. Don't hold your breath. It's a mythic. But, um, Afflict 3. Hello. Doesn't really matter if they block him or not. It's a 4-6 for 5. That's good enough, especially considering inf Afflict. And, um, the funny thing is when it becomes blocked, it deals 3 damage to target opponent. Or they lose 3 life, whatever. Um, if you grant it trample, but they still blocked it, it still got blocked. So, little consideration there. Um, at the beginning of your post-combat main phase, add one red mana to your mana pool for each one life your opponents have lost this turn. Not per instance, per life point. Ooh, that'll keep the game rolling. I mean, once you already have five mana, do you really need more? But, I don't know. I mean, if it's like a card draw deck, not gonna happen in red, but th this is just good. I would throw it in. I mean, come on. Next up, Nimble Obstructionist. No surprise here. I mean, it's basically a uh, counter spell for activated or triggered abilities. That's actually not why I like it. It's a 3-1, specifically 3 attack with flash. You just drop it in, chump, and they're dead. Also, it's flying, so it's 3 damage in the air for 3. I mean, if they gave it Vigilance, this would be the best damn card in the set. Unfortunately, they didn't. And if you really don't need it, it has cycling three. I mean, it's not like they needed to make that any better, but whatever. 
Uh, next up, Oasis Ritualist. Um, this is just good in general. I mean, it, there's nothing too special about this. It's like, oh, tap it and add a mana of any color. Cool, fixing. But it's also a 2-4 creature, so you can block some stuff. It's very obstructionist to the, you know, to 3-3s, three we'll say. Um, but then if you exert it, you can add two mana of any one color to your mana pool. So you can cast a six cost a lot earlier than you would normally be able to. And then it doesn't really matter that this doesn't untap because now you've probably got like a huge six, six creature on the field or something. Oh, that, or you just blew the entire board up <laughs> with a really expensive board wipe or something. So that's just good. If, if you pull this and you're playing green, go for it. And the cool thing is this is a common, by the way, from now on, Anything in Amonkhet, instead of being called a common, is going to be called a Tutan common. So, next up, Oketra's Last Mercy. Your life total becomes equal to your starting life total. Who cares about lands? They're not going to deal 20 damage in one turn. They're just not. This is just annoying. If I'm playing white, I don't even care about the double white. You sure as hell aren't going to cast this on turn three anyway. This is just good. The, the, you make them kill you twice. I mean, it's just hilarious. Next up, Pride Sovereign. This one's overlooked as hell. So, oh, it gets plus one for each cat you control. Cool, maybe a cat tribal deck will be good. But if I can't control the number of cats, I shouldn't play this card, and it's only two, two for three. Hell no. Now, the problem is it costs white to do this, so you would have to have white and green. But exert him. Create two one one white cat creature tokens with lifelink. Lifelink, holy crap, Lifelink is really good at the pre-release. And then guess what? As soon as he does finally untap, woo, watch yourself. He's a 4-4 four, four then, and you could do it, you know, multiple times, and you'll have, you know, 10 turns of this guy out. I mean, come on. Plus, it's not like he costs 5, he costs 3. I mean, that's just plain amazing. Speaking of just plain amazing, Ronus's Last Stand, you basically create a 5-4 snake token for 2. I mean, who cares about lands not untapping? They ain't gonna swing at you. You do this on turn two, the loss of your next turn, mana-wise, does not mean a damn thing, because you're going to win. Next up, one of my personal favorites, because it's clearly a Sphinx, even though it doesn't technically say it on the type bar, but um, it's Riddle form. It only costs two, and it's a Scry on a stick, and you could do it twice if you have six mana. That's just cool, because Scry one is always useful. Uh, but then whenever you cast a non-creature spell, you may, you don't have to, but you may have Riddle form become a 3-3 Sphinx with flying, uh, in addition to its other type. So, oh, they could still blow it up as an enchantment, whatever. So, evasion much? I mean, the fact that it isn't by default a creature all the time, there goes, you know, sorcery speed. Well, maybe. It depends if you, like, cast a spell and then block, but whatever. I mean, even if you never turn it into a Sphinx or you do it once or twice, um, scry one. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'd definitely put it in if I'm playing blue. Next up, Spellweaver Eternal. I cannot believe that this is a Tutan Common. Almost said it wrong. It's a zombie Naga wizard, which is already cool, even though uh, Nagas are Hindu, not Egyptian. No, I'm never going to stop saying that. It has prowess. That's pretty big. I mean, it's not as big as constructed because you can't necessarily control the number of non-creature spells, but in blue, you're probably playing a couple non-creature spells at least, so prowess, yay. Um, otherwise it's a 2-1 for 2, I mean 2 damage for 2, that's in blue not that bad, and then a flick 2, which is hilarious, so no matter what they're taking 2 damage. And then you know you add the possibility of prowess, the possibility of a flick going off once or twice, the possibility of boosting this with like a plus 3 plus 3 and then using it again after a flick has already gone off, it's just plain good, and I'm very happy that it's not a rare. Next up, Steward of Solidarity. Um, you can exert it and create a 1-1 one, one White Warrior creature token with the Vigilance, and it's a 2-2 two, two for 2. So 2-2s two, for 2 are just, you know, solid. They're, they're not great, but they're good. Um, losing it for one turn, it's only a 2-2, two, two, whatever. And then you've got a 1-1 one, one White Warrior creature token with Vigilance. So automatic swing if they have nothing to block with. Otherwise, you can swarm them. It's a chump blocker. It, you just have control of the battlefield, and if you never want to use that ability, that's fine. You just, you know, have a 2-2 two, two for 2. Next up, Struggle to Survive. Struggle deals damage to target creature equal to the number of lands you control. Not basic lands, just lands. That's probably going to be like 5, 6, or 7 in a hurry. I mean, welcome to pre-release. So, I mean, yeah, 3 mana removal, and it's an instant. All right. Early game, you know, you could deal 3 damage, and uh, then 2 more with a creature, and you just killed the biggest creature. Next up, Sunset Pyramid. This one's pretty wild. It enters the battlefield with three brick counters on it. You pay two, tap it, remove a brick counter, and then draw a card. So you get to draw three cards for eight mana, which doesn't sound that great, but it's split. You don't have to pay it all up front. And then the cool thing is, in between drawing, and, and not really because, well, scry, uh, and then you can't immediately untap it, then draw, 
But still, your next draw step, or you could do this before your draw step, don't forget that. You could pay two and just scry. It doesn't affect the number of brick counters. So guaranteed bonus cards like game, anti-top decking measures, I guess. And otherwise, you could scry every single turn, every single upkeep, or every single uh, opponent's end step. So lots of flexibility here. Torment of Hailfire, one of the absolute best spells in the set, plus purple, I need it in foil, I don't just want it, I need it. It's double black X, repeat the following process X times, it'll probably be a lot at pre-release, each opponent loses 3 life unless they sacrifice a non-land permanent or discard a card, they're going to be short on both at the pre-release. Um, they're probably going to lean towards discarding cards because a lot of people are holding junk they don't need. But still, I mean, even at like two, this is devastating. So no matter what turn you cast this on, it is going to wreck them. This can single-handedly win the game. Next up, Torment of Scarabs. No surprise here, Enchant Player. Oh yes, it's an ongoing problem. At the beginning of the Enchanted Player's upkeep, that player loses three life unless he or she sacrifices a non-land permanent or discards a card. Hey, that sounds familiar. And it's just over and over and over and over and over. Throw this on them on turn four, they almost can't win the game. Uh, and then next up, of course, Torment of Venom. Put three negative one counters on target creature. Its controller loses three life unless he or she sacrifices another non-land permanent. So not the one that you put the three negative one counters on, I assume is the way they phrase that. Uh, or discards a card. Hey, that sounds familiar. It's almost like the torments all work together. So um, yeah, it's a toot and common rarity too. Uh, next up, Tragic Lesson. Um, yeah, that's tragic. Kefnet's dead. Oh no. But, well, you know, should have been better at fighting. So, draw two cards, then discard a card, unless you return a land you control to its owner's hand, which uh, you'll probably have no trouble doing. And it does say then, it's an after effect, so you get to see the cards first. And then if it's like, oh, I can't cast any of this this turn, okay, now return a land you control to its owner's hand. Also, if you didn't like one of the two cards, discard it. So the timing on that is quite good. I mean, just a draw two for three, pretty damn good, despite the uh, slight minor downsides. So that's it for now. Um, I'm sure I missed like a couple. I kind of skimmed and I also fell asleep three times while trying to read this. I mean like, you know, Hour of Glory is good to exile target creature for four. Duh. I mean, it's a removal, but that's a little too obvious. So yeah, look through the cards yourself. You know, get a good idea of what people will be playing. Um, there's a lot of garbage cards, like any single card in the entire set that references the word desert, useless. Don't even bother. The probability of you having enough deserts and full control over them just don't it's just not gonna happen hopefully you guys uh found this helpful um i have to miss the entire pre-release because of work so i'm already pissed about that uh there's a tiny chance i'll be able to go on sunday otherwise uh next week i'll see all of you that's right i'm teleporting all 26,000 of you to kitsune con i hope you didn't have plans i'll see you guys next video